In his 2019 State of the Union address, President Trump announced a goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. Doing that won't be simple. There are still tens of thousands of new HIV infections in the U.S. every year, and the epidemic is growing rapidly among certain vulnerable communities. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Wafa El Sadr, Director of ICAP at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. El Sadr has co-authored a perspective article about lessons the United States can learn from Africa's HIV response in order to control its own epidemic. Dr. El Sadr, can you give us a brief overview of the trends we've seen in new HIV infections in the United States over the past couple of decades? Over the past decade or so, there really has not been a change in the numbers of new infections in this country in the United States. It has stood at around 38 to 40,000 new infections per year. And these new infections are occurring in specific populations, uh, very vulnerable populations. So the vast majority of new infections are occurring amongst men who have sex with men, particularly young men who have sex with men of color, as well as among women of color transgender women, and also, again, infections are occurring as outbreaks amongst persons who inject drugs. You say in your article that remarkable progress has been made in some regions of Africa in confronting HIV. Why has progress in the United States been so slow in comparison? I have been involved in both the response to HIV in the U.S. as well as globally. And there are several characteristics that I think enable a successful response globally. One of them is that there were certain approaches that were embedded in the attempt to scale up HIV prevention and treatment globally. For example, an important principle was the use of the public health approach, which is a very interesting approach that really was at the core of the success of the scale-up. And by public health approach, uh, this means that you really try to bring the services to the people right where they're at. So it's not about reaching the few who can get excellent services at a big hospital or at a capital city. It's about reaching all of the people who need the services. So this means decentralization of services and reaching out to rural areas and remote areas where people living with HIV or people at risk for HIV reside. I think another element of the public health approach was simplifying the delivery of the services themselves. So using a very simple algorithmic approach, using a consistent regimen for treatment, for example, using a very consistent schedule for monitoring and conducting the laboratory assays. And this enabled non-physician clinicians, nurses and nurse practitioners and others to be able to actually engage and contribute to the scale-up activities and the expansion of treatment and prevention. So that's just one example of how this remarkable success has been achieved over the past decade globally. I think there are other reasons as well that are important to keep in mind. One was the engagement of communities, and which has been very critical in the global response in order to overcome enormous stigma discrimination in many, many countries around the world. And this has been also very much supported by actually employing people living with HIV to be able to provide the services to reach beyond the walls of clinics and hospitals to the communities that they know best. And then another third reason for the success has been the focus on evidence base, the focus on scientific evidence, and quickly including new discoveries in the response itself. So, for example, what's distinguished the global response has been this remarkable rapid incorporation of new testing approaches, new antiretroviral drugs, new prevention modalities, taking the new evidence and rapidly bringing into action, rapidly taking the evidence into programs has been also very, very important to the global response. I think last an important aspect of the global response has been what has been called knowing your epidemic. This has been the mantra, is that the response should be guided by the evidence and that every country and every community should know its own epidemic. And this has allowed for the countries around the world to be able to take the data and to focus what they're doing with enormous precision to the communities that are severely affected, to the populations that are severely affected. So it guided them to be able to act where they needed to act. And I think these are just a few of the elements that have enabled the global success thus far. So if we look at those four elements, how do you envision an approach in the United States that would lead to the same kinds of success? 
think it's quite possible in the U.S. to achieve the success. I think it will need very concerted effort and enormous determination. And urgency, I think the word urgency is very, very important to keep in mind, is that we don't have time to lose and we need to achieve results very quickly. Of course, number one and very important is having the resources to be able to do this. And additional resources are needed to be able to do all of the efforts that are being put in place now. I think knowing the epidemic and knowing what's happening, I think the focus on the counties and municipalities where new infections are occurring at a higher rate is very, very helpful. And setting goals is very, very important. But nonetheless, there's another step beyond that, which is really trying to monitor and measure progress towards achieving those targets and those goals and those milestones very, very carefully, and then being ready to reassess the response, stop doing what's not working, and then start doing something else that may have a better chance of working. So this ability to be nimble and to be evaluating and assessing and measuring as we move ahead will be very important. And then I think another element that is using the scientific evidence, I think there have been studies that have showed what worked and what doesn't work. So we need to very carefully, again, anchor the response in evidence and provide the supportive services that will bring vulnerable populations to the services they need. I think the issue of expansion of insurance, for example, and reaching out to disenfranchised groups is very, very critical in order to overcome a lot of the societal, cultural, economic barriers that exist today amongst the populations most at risk for HIV in this country. So according to what you say, a lot depends on the gathering of high-quality information to reach decisions. How can researchers and policymakers quickly get on-the-ground data and therefore coordinate federal and local efforts in the United States? I think there are data that are available. We are very fortunate in this country to have a very robust and strong HIV surveillance system that does measure the numbers of new people with HIV infection, those with HIV infection who are on treatment, those who are not on treatment, and we're able to map where new infections are happening and in which populations. I do think we have at our fingertips a lot of data that actually didn't exist until very recently in many countries around the world. I think what we need to do is take those surveillance data and then almost use the data in a very dynamic way so that it can be interpreted to the person who is working in a specific community so they know exactly who they need to reach and how many they need to reach and by when. So the data do exist. I think it's trying to disaggregate the data to very small units so that people on the ground know what they need to achieve and where they need to do the work they need to do. You mentioned earlier the importance of bringing services to rural areas. And in a related perspective article, Kishore and colleagues report that less than a quarter of rural counties in the United States that are most vulnerable to HIV and hepatitis C outbreaks are operating syringe exchange programs in 2018, so three-quarters of the counties are not. What kinds of strategies do you think could be used to increase access to that sort of program? I think this is an example of how the critical importance of actually putting in place services that are based on evidence. We have a lot of evidence that needle and syringe exchange programs work. They work for prevention of HIV. They work for prevention of hepatitis C. But they need to be put in place and they need to be scaled up. And part of the problem has been resistance amongst communities, for example, resistance amongst policymakers, misperceptions that somehow putting in place syringe exchange programs will lead to an increase in drug use and exacerbation of the current opioid epidemic. There's no evidence that this happens. Nonetheless, there are a lot of misperceptions and fears in the communities as well as amongst the policymakers. And I think it requires a concerted effort to say something has to be done and we know what needs to be done and they need to act and the push needs to come from the communities themselves as well as also from all of us in the scientific community that need to keep pushing to put forth and implement and scale up what we know works. So in that regard, finally, what kinds of policy changes do you think will be helpful or necessary to end HIV in the United States? What should the politicians be looking at? I believe there are a lot of different ways of thinking about it. I would say one example would be a syringe and needle exchange programs and doing away with all the impediments to putting these in place in the counties and municipalities where they're needed. So I think that's an example of one. I think another one would be enabling or putting in place again the financial systems that allow people to access the services. 
I think, for example, the insurance, we have a very fractured health system in this country. And for many, accessing the services is impeded by failure to access insurance. And therefore, people cannot access the testing, they cannot access the treatments and so on. This is very vital is to have individuals at risk have the resources to be able to access the services. And then I think there are other issues that need to be also addressed and they're more difficult to address. And those are, of course, trying to put in place some societal changes and cultural changes that do not shun people who are disenfranchised. For example, sexual minorities, gay men and transgender women, for example, are disenfranchised in our society. And putting in place the safeguards for these populations will be very, very important because they're critical as partners in order to overcome the HIV epidemic in the U.S. Thank you, Dr. Al-Sadr. 